the book of Revelation. Uh, this is, I believe, part, is it four or five? Five. So five weeks. And um, just a little bit, don't, don't want my life to be a distraction to you in any way as I preach, but, but I am someone who has to live during the week and work during the week and then come to preach. And man, you guys just got to know, um, there's a lot of great things going on in this church. God is moving in some amazing ways, but amongst the amazing ways that God is moving in this church There are also many of you who are going through some really difficult times, unexpected circumstances. There are things that are going on that are hurtful to you. There are things that are going on that are weighing you down. And I'm finding out about these things and I'm trying to walk with some of you through these things. And and this week in particular, I, I just... I told you last week was tough. This week, it, it was just like, wow, I, I don't have much emotional energy to, to bring to the message. I felt like I, I was really depleted. And in the midst of, of feeling like, what am I going to say? And do I have the energy to say anything? I had to go back to why. Why do I preach? Why am I going through the book of Revelation? And I just want to encourage you. When times are tough in your marriage, when times are tough at your job, when times are tough in your relationship with God, sometimes the most helpful thing you could do is you just gotta ask yourself, why did I start this again? Why did I start this journey? Why did I start going to this church? Why did I start getting involved in this discipleship relationship or a part of this small group? Why did I say yes to this job? Why did I say yes to Jesus? And in going back to why, I'm so grateful, I'm so thankful to God that he reminded me, that he filled me anew, and so why are we talking about the book of Revelation? This last book of the Bible that's so confusing, so many times can be misinterpreted in so many ways, we're going through this book because after I came back from my three month sabbatical this past summer, oh, it seems like it was so long ago, uh, gosh, Um, I had an assignment. I don't know much. I don't hear much from God. I I don't know when he's talking to me. It's still confusing, but I know very clearly I was supposed to come back and teach the book of Revelation and show the people of God the worthiness of God. I was to show the people of God the worthiness of God. Worth itness, said another way. I wanted to show you that God was was worth it because I think if we're being honest, when we don't follow him, when we don't obey, when we fall into sin and we don't repent of our sin, many times at the bottom of that disobedience, at the bottom of not being faithful is we just don't think he's worth it. And that's a sobering reality. We'd never say with our mouths, oh, God isn't worth it. You could be honest, right? We do the things that are worth it. You spend money on things, good, bad, and different, because to you, it's worth it. You drive far distances to be with your boo. Why? Because to you, it's worth it. And to the boo you won't drive out to, you don't do it because he or she is not worth it. Our lives in many ways work around opportunity cost. Is it worth it? And I think if we're being honest, when it comes to the things of God, many times it's just not worth it to us. So I say it this way, and I want us to get to the point where even if God's blessings, favor, help, wisdom, and rescue seem distant or even absent, God's character still makes him worthy of our praise and worship. That God's character still makes it worth it. Some of us, we lose hope, we lose faith when things aren't going our way because we're focusing on whether or not he's blessing us. And I would like to bring us to a point where whether or not he's blessing us doesn't impact us as much as his character does. Are you with me? 
Uh, so here's a question to consider. Is our love and affection for God swayed by the ever-changing winds of what he does, or is it anchored in the eternal nature of who he is? Where are you today, friend, Christian, non-Christian? Is your love and affection for God like a roller coaster, up and down, up and down, based on whether or not he's blessing you, there for you? The winds blow, he's, he's good to you, and so you're good with him. He's not so good to you, and so you're distant from him. When he takes you high, you're high, but when he brings you low, you're low. Man, it's, that's exhausting spirituality. But I'm so thankful for an anchor that is the character of God, the eternal nature of God, so that when the winds of his blessing and the winds of circumstance come, his character keeps me anchored. Christ alone, cornerstone. And so here are some of the characteristics that we've learned through the book of Revelation that I'm hoping anchor you maybe when circumstances aren't going your way. God is revelatory. He reveals himself. He, he comes down and he discloses himself to mankind. God is eternal. Alpha, omega, beginning in the end, first and the last. He's above time. All of time is in his hands. He is all-knowing. And so regardless of whether your money's right, regardless of whether your relationship's going right, regardless of whether he's answering your prayers, these things are true. These things are true, and I'm hoping for our church anchored by the truths of who God is. And so the tension question, every single week around here, we ask a question that hopefully you're interested in the answer to, that the text that we're studying brings an answer to. And the tension question for today is, what does this next passage of scripture in the book of Revelation reveal about the character of God? Today, we are going to add a fourth characteristic of God. Last week, we kind of summarized the previous three and we wrapped our heads further around the previous three. Today, I'm going to introduce a new one through the teaching. Now, for those of you who are new to Bible study, new to understanding the book of Revelation, this last book in the library of books which makes up the Bible, on this next slide here, what we have is a map of seven churches that existed uh, in the day, A.D. 90 or so, 90 days, uh, 90 days, 90 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ is when John is writing through a revelation from God. That's where we get the book, a revelation, the apocalypse, the end times. He is writing letters to each of these churches. And we looked at, if we could go back, please, to the map. We, we looked at the church at Ephesus a couple weeks ago. We looked at the church of Smyrna. Everyone say Smyrna. That name still sounds cool to me. And then we've got Pergamos that we're looking at today. John in AD 90 on an island called Patmos, real place in a real time, gets a vision from God and writes a letter to the church at Pergamos. Now, this city still exists today in modern day Turkey. It is known as Bergama now, something to the effect of like Bergama. And back in that day, Pergamus, Pergamum could be compared to like the Washington DC of the United States. It was a, a port city, a lot of action going on, a lot of influence in the rest of the area, politics going on there, other gods being worshiped there. And so that's the context of, of who this letter is being written to. So the letter is only six verses or so. I'm gonna read them in their entirety. I'm gonna to read to you this letter so you can see it in full, and then I'll provide an outline for you of how we're gonna go through the teaching, and then we'll go from there. So let's take a look. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn them to Revelation chapter two. 
um, verses tw- uh, 12 through 17, or on your phones, or you can follow along on the screen. Here we go. This is the word of the Lord to the church at Pergamum. And to the angel, bless you. God bless you. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also, you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. Oh, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with the new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. This was the letter from John to the church at Pergamum, from God. Now, here's the outline for today. Four parts. I'm gonna give you a brief interpretation of this text. We're not gonna spend a whole lot of time in it. Uh, It's only six verses or so. It's it's pretty quick to wrap our heads around. I don't wanna get lost in the details. So I'm gonna give you a brief interpretation. From the interpretation, we're gonna pull one main point. Uh, Let's go back. Three implications. Gonna give you three implications of the main point that I'm gonna make. And then we'll respond. Today, in particular, I'm gonna give you a chance to respond to this word in in a way that we don't typically respond to the word. But I think a word like this to the church at Pergamum, which is one also to us, is a message that demands a response. And so here's the interpretation through these words here. I I stole this from another pastor, so it's, it's not me. What we see in this letter is a commendation, a condemnation, a command, and a commitment. This letter can be interpreted purely by following these four words all throughout the letter. And so let me just point them out to you. Let me show you each of these things, and then we'll move on to applying it to our lives. Let's check this out. Let's see the commendation. He commends them. He gives them props. For what? Let's take a look at the verse here. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, Even the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. So let's just, I know, you're like, where Satan dwells, where Satan's throne is. What's that all about? In this city of Pergamum, there were people who were propagating the message of Satan, the message of the world. And you'll see this in in just a moment more specifically, but there were people who were not honoring to God in this city. Satan dwelled there. And what God commends the church at Pergamum for is by holding fast. Even though there were conflicting messages, the church at Pergamum held fast to his name and they did not deny the faith even when one of their own, Antipas, we don't know anything else about him, but even when he was killed for his faith, they did not waver. So God commends them for holding fast to their faith. If you are here today and you are holding fast to your faith, even in the light of different circumstances around you, God would say, I commend you. I commend you for holding fast. What's next? He commends them, but he also then condemns them. There's a strong word here from God. Take a look at it. He says, but I have a few things against you. He has this against you. Remember at the church at Ephesus, he has this against you. You have left your first love. Last year, uh, last year, oh my gosh. Last week, the church at Smyrna, there was nothing against the church at Smyrna. 
They were, they were good. They were all good. All he had to say to them was, be faithful to the end. But now to the church at Pergamum, he has this against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam. Balaam is an Old Testament prophet. You could read about him in Numbers, I think like 21 through 24. If you wanna do some extra Bible study, because I know you all wanna do extra Bible study this afternoon. Yeah, there you go. 21 through 24, you could read all about Balaam. There's a donkey in this story. There's a lot going on. But what's important to know about Balaam is actually said right here in the text. He taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. That's all bad. He's a prophet of God, yet he is a stumbling block to the nation of Israel. He does some positive things, but he also does some negative things as a prophet. And what John is writing on behalf of God to the church at Pergamum, he's saying, you are holding on to teachings that have you leaning in to sexual immorality and indulging yourself just in the same way that Balaam did. And then he said, you also have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, we'll remember the church at Ephesus, God gave them props for hating the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Unfortunately, the church at Pergamum is holding to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. What is this teaching of the Nicolaitans? We really don't know. But if he's putting it side by side by Balaam's teaching, Basically, it's false teaching. It's teaching that you should not be paying attention to, responding to with faith. It is teaching that causes you to put yourself above God. That's this false teaching that they're involved with. So this is what God has against the church at Pergamum. Let's keep it moving. From the condemnation to the, on the next slide, the command. In light of the fact that you are leaning in to false teaching, I have a command, and the command is simple, as we see here in the text. Repent. Therefore, repent. Turn around. Go in the other direction. Don't keep going towards the direction of false teaching. Repent, ask for the forgiveness of God, and go the other way. Everyone say repent. Repent. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Repent means to change your mind about a situation. To turn around and to go back towards God, he tells the church at Pergamum, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. I will bring judgment. I command you to repent because judgment is coming. And then we have the commitment as we close. If you do repent, God commits to the church at Pergamum the following. I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now we know manna in the Old Testament was bread from heaven, bread from heaven. And if you connect this to the false teaching of moving towards sexual immorality, God is saying, I'm gonna give you something better than this false intimacy in the world. I'm gonna give you the hidden manna, not just the physical bread that comes from the sky, but the bread of life, who is me? I'm gonna give you me. If you repent, I'm gonna give you me. I'm gonna give you a white stone and a new name. There's a bunch of interpretations about what that means. The point is, you will be rewarded. You will be rewarded. You will spend an eternity with God in heaven. So that's the interpretation. There's a commendation. Thank you for holding fast. There's a condemnation, but you hold to this fast teaching, uh, false teaching. You need to stop that. There's a condemnation. There's a, uh, what's the word? There's a challenge. I don't know. What's the third thing? A command. There's a command. Repent. If I can't remember this, you're definitely not going home remembering any of this. There's a command to repent, and there's a commitment that I'm gonna give you me, there will be reward, okay. So, here's the main point from the text. 
one main point. I think it's the main point of the text to Pergamum, and I believe it's the main point of the text for us. Let me just give it to you here. Repent of holding to false teaching that causes you to indulge in the desires of the flesh. We, as a church, well, first, let's, let's keep it in Pergamum. God is saying in Pergamum, repent of the false teaching that causes you to indulge in the desires of the flesh. And I believe that that word for that city and for that church in that city is just as valid of a word for us. How many of you would agree? That there is false teaching inside the church and outside the church that if we pay attention to it, it causes us to indulge in the desires of the flesh. Do you know, and I've taught messages like this, I'm guilty, number one, that you could actually hear a message in church that instead of you going to God as a result of that message, it actually uses God as a reason to indulge in more of what you want. And some people love those kind of messages. All your dreams are gonna come true. You're gonna be rich. Just give and you will receive and you're gonna live the blessed life and everything you have. And everyone's like, yay, yay, yay. Can I just tell you this? You need to be careful if you're listening to a message and amening everything. If you're amening everything, that would like kind of mean you've got it all down. Like the message that you really need to, I mean, hopefully messages are bringing some sort of conviction into your heart. I read one kind of thing about revival and it's like revivals, you know revival is happening not when people are hooting and hollering, but when the church is silent because the Holy Spirit of God is bringing conviction to areas of their life, that conviction has not yet been brought. We're just, yeah, man, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you just might be propagating the false ideas in your own mind. I don't want that for our church. Now, that doesn't mean you never say amen in here, but you know what I'm saying? Repent of holding to the false teaching that causes you to indulge in the desires of the flesh. So here's what I wanted to do for the remainder of the message. I wanted to, as we look into three implications now of this repenting of false teaching, I wanted to, I wanted to just, I was thinking like, how can I summarize like the false teaching that I think is really prevalent out there inside the church and outside the church? And so I'm gonna show you some false teachings and then I'm gonna show you kind of the implications of taking that false teaching, how it could lead us astray. So let's take a look at, at what I think, and they're all the same in terms of false teachings of 2019. Follow your heart. But some of you, you repost that stuff all over the gram. Follow my heart, yay. Oh, I'm so inspired. And believe me, before I was a preacher guy, I like did motivational type speaking. Like, I'm the false teacher. I, no, not I am. I was, I was the false teacher. <laughs> Can you imagine cutting out that clip? I am a false teacher. <laughs> All right, uh, I was the guy saying, follow your heart, follow your heart. Let me just walk through these and then I'll undermine them in just a second. Do what feels right. What? How many of you have ever done what felt right and it got you into a lot of trouble? Some of the deepest regrets of your life are because you did what felt right. Some of you are suffering from consequences today because you did something that felt right. How about this one here? Don't do anything you don't want to do. What? Okay. Okay, okay. And you guys are laughing. We love this stuff. You eat this stuff up. 
Oh, follow my heart. Oh, can't just follow. Where's my heart taking me? Oh, it's taking me here. Oh, it's taking me there. There's my heart. My heart will take me over this stage. You know what the scripture says? The scripture says our hearts are deceitful and they're wicked and they're beyond cure. You want to follow that heart? Do what it feels right. You know, there's another passage that says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to destruction. That's, that's, that's the Bible. There's a way that seems right to a man. Do what feels right. It seems right, but in the end, it leads to destruction. Don't do anything you don't want to do. Oh my gosh. Jesus said, if you want to follow after me, you have to deny yourself. Let's just say that together. Like I said it, deny yourself. Turn to your neighbor and say, deny yourself. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. When was the last time you denied yourself? We don't do this very well. We eat what we want to eat. Come on, somebody. You spend what you want to spend. You get on Instagram and social media for as long as you want to do it until your eyes are bloodshot. We watch as much TV as we want to watch. We go wherever we want to go. We complain however we want to complain. Self-control, specifically as it relates to denial, is just something we're not good at because if, if we don't want to do it, we don't do it, and if we do want to do it, we do it. Unfortunately, the scripture says, Jesus says, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Let's just be honest for a moment. How have we fallen into following these false teachings? What do you do because you have this narrative of follow your heart in mind? What sins do you commit because you do what feels right? In what ways do you dishonor God because you don't do anything you don't want to do? God sent Jesus to the cross. God sent Jesus to the cross. And we are to be followers of Christ. And so there are going to be some things, friends, that he calls us to do that we don't want to do. The Christian life is actually doing the things we don't want to do while trusting God to do the rest. That's, Christianity is basically a bunch of, can I tell you, I, you can ask my wife. I was like, I don't want to preach tomorrow. I don't have anything to say to these people. And these people don't listen to me anyways. Come on. Let me just tell you, I'm just being honest. I don't want to be here. Not like not right now, but like there's times where I don't want to do this. There's times when I'm counseling people and I know you're going to whatever, but I'm just being honest and I don't want to be patient with you. But can you imagine how bad it would be for all of us if every time I didn't do what I didn't want to do, I just didn't do it? Let me just tell you, our conversations will be short. No more 45 minute, one hour, one and a half hour conversations with Ed because I don't want to do that. But I know no one's gonna ever call me again. This is always what happens. Stay away from Ed. He doesn't want to, no, it's just, I'm just trying to tell you, I, if I buy into this, I'm gonna be a horrible pastor. If you buy into this, you're going to be a horrible Christian. False teachings. And it's even worse when people attach Bible verses to this stuff. They attach Bible verses and give whole sermons around this stuff. And so here, before you go to the next slide, hold on one second. Don't go just yet. But I'm going to walk us through Three implications in my remaining time. It's not going to be much Bible verses. This is just me trying to, to pastor our church, knowing you and knowing some of the struggles that you're going through. 
there are some, some specific implications that I want to address that if we buy into this false teaching of do what feels right, blah, 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 all that stuff, we're going to fall into these three areas that are going to be very detrimental to our lives. I'm just going to put all three of them up, and then we'll talk through them. Go for it. Go for it. There it is. Three implications of following false teaching. One, you're careless with your words. Two, you're mastered by your emotions. And number three, you're resistant to counsel. You guys ready? <laughs> Can I talk to you for a minute? Yeah, is it okay if I talk to you for a minute? I love you. I love you. This might hurt a little bit. Let me talk about being careless with your words. Let me just give you a verse. Just death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And if you do what feels right, many times what feels right is to kill people with your words. It's to say whatever on your, whatever's on your mind. Here's another false teaching. Express yourself. Sometimes that's a bad idea. Husband, let me just tell you, you live by the mantra of express yourself. Husband, you're going to be on the couch. There's going to be some times when you need to take whatever expression you have and just shove it for a little bit because it's not going to help the situation. Husband, don't be careless with your words with your wife. Don't do what feels right. Don't say whatever's on your mind. Fathers, let me stick with the men for a minute. Watch your tone, watch your words with your kids. Think there's a passage that says something to the effect of don't exacerbate your children. Don't make it worse with your words. Fathers, are you being careless with your words with your children? And how is this connected to false teaching? Because false teaching says, do what you want to do. You buy into that, that means you're just going to say whatever you want to say. Husbands, say amen. Wives, wives, don't be careless with your words. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Wives, everything you say to your husbands can either be a tool for edification and building up, or it could be a sledgehammer that destroys. And I hear it too often, and I see it with my own eyes too often, both husbands speaking poorly to their wives and wives speaking poorly and disrespectfully to their husbands. And it breaks my heart because wives in particular, you have a unique opportunity to build up the bruised ego that we have within us. The way we carry ourselves and how we, we I heard one pastor's wife say, she keeps a picture of her husband, and this husband was like a, real, a past president of a denomination, like really influential leader, a, a, a mega church pastor. And she goes, I keep a picture of my husband, maybe it was a Halloween picture, and it's her husband who now is like in his 60s, like in a little Superman outfit as a little boy. And she keeps that picture in front of her because she realizes, you know what, that doesn't matter what that man is doing, really on the inside, he's just a little boy who wants to be a hero. And she didn't say that in some demeaning way. But wise, let me just clue you into your husband. He's not as confident as you think he is. He's not as strong as you think he is. He doesn't have it together as much as you think he does. And every time, you rag on him for what he's doing and what he's not doing and call him and calling him out. You're tearing him down. How is this connected to false teaching? 
because you've bought into the false teaching that says, say what you want to say, express what you want to express. When the scriptures would teach us, deny yourself. What words do you use at work? You loosen up your language at work. You put on the Jesus language in church, but you get to work and you're totally someone different. I've been there. I know what that's like. Careless with your words. Careless with your words with coworkers. Let me me say under this here, gossip. Gossip is being careless with your words because I just want to share what I want to share. Want to express myself. You can't, wouldn't believe what I saw. You wouldn't believe what I heard. You know, the one I have to watch out for as it relates to careless with your words is humor. I just want to be funny. It was just funny. But Jesus says, deny yourself. So sometimes it means not being funny when you know it could be funny because your funny might hurt somebody. This all could be rooted in a false teaching of say what you want to say, do what you want to do, don't do anything you don't want to do. Well, I don't want to keep my mouth shut. So I'm just going to say what I want to say. How many of us have some room to grow as it relates to the words that we use with our spouse, with our friends, with our family members? Someone say amen. Another thing that I see happening in our church family because sometimes it could be related to this idea of do what I want to do and feel how I want to feel and is we come, become mastered by our emotions. I, I read as I was studying for this, are your emotions and your feelings, they should be gauges, not guides. Your feelings and your emotions should alert you to what's going on inside of you, not guide you to wherever they take you? Are your feelings and emotions gauges or guides? Do they provide information or for you, do they give you direction? Your emotions shouldn't direct you. Your emotions should give you information and at some point you have to separate the facts of how you feel from the truth of who God is. The facts of what you feel, how others are making you feel, what that conversation made you feel, that's fact. What do the young kids say? Facts, facts, facts. Okay, I'm all about facts. How about truth? How does truth play into your facts? And the truth is what? God loves you. The truth is God sent his son Jesus to die for you. The truth is in Christ, there's no good that you could do that could make God love you anymore and no bad that you could do that could make God love you any less. But when we buy into the lie that feel how I wanna feel, say what I wanna say, isn't that a song, John Mayer? Say what you need to say? That's, That's not gospel. Yes, we speak up, and I'm not saying you always hide your feelings. I'm not saying any of that. But when your feelings become a direct opposition to the truth of God's word, you need to do something about that. We've got to lead our hearts into truth through the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. That's why if you're not a believer in this room, you can't do this. You don't have the power to... It only the Holy Spirit of God can illuminate truth and allow you to follow it in a way that serves you best. This is a whole talk in and of itself, being mastered by emotions. Maybe we'll revisit it one day. But for those of you who give yourselves room to sin because of how you feel, that is not godly. But I feel bad, but I feel hurt, but I feel, but I feel that Feeling is no excuse for sin. Now, we need to be good brothers and sisters and meet people where they're at, meet people in their feelings. 
but we cannot just co-sign them being mastered by their emotions. Last but not least, it's resistant to counsel. When you're buying into the false teaching that says do whatever you wanna do, say whatever you wanna say, follow your heart, whenever someone says something opposite of that, you're gonna push them away. You're gonna eject from the relationship. Why are you being a hater? Why are you all up in my it mix? Oh, here's the other one I should have put. Do you. I'm just doing me. I'll tell you, doing you is gonna do you in. <laughs> doing you is gonna get you into trouble. And what happens when a, a pastor or a leader speaks into your life and is not just gonna allow you to do you? That's what happens when we buy into false teaching. We resist the counsel of God in our lives. Which one of these here, before we move forward, you could just say, you know what? I need to work on this. I need to ask that correct teaching would help me to not be careless with my words, to not be mastered my, by my emotions, to not be resistant to the counsel that God brings into my life. How many of you can find yourself somewhere on this screen? Say amen. Amen. Okay. So, last pivot before we get to the response is another attribute of God. What attribute of God do we see here? What attribute of God do we maybe feel here? Let's take a look at the three first. Revelatory, eternal, he's all-knowing. You might like these more than the next one, but the next one I wanna share with you is that God is corrective. God is disciplinary. God is reproving. It's who he is. I wanna just show you some scriptures and, and then I'll give us our response and then we'll go. Behold, in the book of Job, blessed is the one whom God reproves, corrects. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty, for he wounds, but he binds up. He shatters, but his hands heal. Blessed is the one whom God reproves. Do you feel yourself being corrected today? Are you in a season of correction? Well, scream from the mountaintops, I am blessed. God loves me enough to keep messing with me. Sometimes I wonder, God, why are you still messing with me? You ever feel that? Why are you messing with me? Why are you messing with me? Because he loves you. God forbid the day when he's no longer messing with you. God forbid the day when he is apathetic towards disciplining you. Man, I've seen some people, I've seen some people, God's not even messing with them anymore. And they're just doing whatever they wanna do. Lord, 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 with me, with my wife, with the movement church, may you never stop bringing your hand of correction into our lives. Keep your hand of correction in our lives. Let's see what else the scriptures have to say about he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. Okay, what? He's making you holy. Are you interested in being holy? Someone say amen. The only way we become holy is through discipline. For the moment, all discipline seems painful. Come on, say amen. This is painful in here right now. It's painful when we're being confronted with sin. But later, oh, later, 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 come on, sooner, not later. But later it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Lord, would you give us your view of discipline in our lives? Lord, would you give us your view of correction in our lives? Last passage here. I think this is Proverbs. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. 
he corrects, he reproves, he dis disciplines those he loves. So what's the response? One response. Three implications, careless with your words, mastered by your emotions, not open to, not waiting for, not receptive of the counsel of God in your life. What is our response? It's the takeaway for today, the sermon in the sentence. To submit to the correction of God is to embrace the affection of God. His correction and his affection are one in the same. He corrects those he loves. The correction that he is bringing in your life is proof of his affection for you. How many of you like proof of love, right? You don't wanna just be told you're loved. You want proof of love. Well, I got a proof that you don't like, but it's proof nonetheless because the scripture tells us. The proof of God's love for you is that he's still correcting you. He still bring correction into your life. So what's the to-do? The to-do is simply this. Oh, no, back. Oh. Uh, is there a to-do slide? <laughs> right on, Braxton. Oh, there's the slide. Yeah, let's do this. Let's do this first. And then we'll go to. Uh, the to-do is to repent of holding to false teaching that causes us to indulge in the desires of the flesh. The to-do is the charge to Pergamum. Repent, repent of the false teaching that we've taken on that has slowly but surely caused us to be careless with our words, mastered by our emotions, refuting discipline in our lives, refuting counsel in our lives. Turn around and say, I don't want to buy into the false teaching. And then you, you saw the verse here, and I, I, I mean, it's just the scripture. Let's put it back to that verse in Proverbs there. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. This is not even the message translation. This is the ESV, elect standard version, not just... He who hates reproof is stupid. I looked this up in the Greek. You know, sometimes I make the funny joke. Uh, it's stupid in the Greek. Well, it, I mean Hebrew. It's Old Testament. It does mean stupid in the Hebrew, but it also means brutish. He who hates reproof is brutish, like a wild man, like a wild woman, like an animal. disciplining you because he loves you. He's correcting you because he loves you. He corrected the church at Pergamum to turn from the false teaching because it would not ultimately do for them what it told them it would do for them. See, this is what false teaching does. It lies. It says, follow your feelings, follow your heart, do what you want to do, don't do what you don't want to do, and you will be blessed, and you will be happy. But you don't need a Bible verse to know that when we've done that in our lives, it has brought us destruction. So don't be brutish. Don't be wild. Place yourself under the submission of God who gave you Jesus. Let me give you gospel here, good news, to die for your careless words. Jesus paid the penalty for your careless words. Jesus paid the penalty for every time you chose your emotions and your feelings over the truth. How many of you are thankful for the mercy of God through the blood of Jesus Christ that covers us from the shame of being careless with our words? of being mastered by our emotions, of rejecting counsel. You don't have to do that anymore in Christ. You are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. 
I could use words that build up. I could be aware of my feelings, yes, but I can introduce truth to those situations. Yes, I can fight counsel off for a minute, but then the Holy Spirit of the Lord makes me humble to say, God, if this is how you would humble me, then let me receive it. We praise God for his grace. We praise God for the gospel that forgives us of all of these sins and any sins that you might be feeling convicted of today. What a church we would be. Can you imagine what kind of community of faith we would be if number one, we didn't buy into false teaching, but number two, that our words were seasoned with grace at all times. That it was a group of authentic people who, yes, they fought their feelings and they understood their feelings and they were in touch with their feelings, but the truth of God reigned in their lives. Imagine a community of people who, as the scripture says, submit to one another as we submit to God. In just a few moments, I told you I was going to give you an opportunity to respond. And this might be in uncomfortable for some, but I, I think in light of a message like this, this might be a proper response. If you're here today and maybe you found yourself somewhere on that screen, careless, mastered, pushing counsel aside, if you found somewhere on that screen, come forward and, and repent. If you find yourself having itching ears to the false teaching of the world, come up to repent, if you wanna place yourself under the correction of God and you just wanna symbolically say, I'm gonna move forward here, I'm gonna walk forward, I don't know exactly how God's correcting me, maybe you fought off correction, but by coming forward, I'm gonna say, God, correct me. I'm open to your correction, I don't want to be stupid. I just wanna encourage you to, to come forward. We're gonna sing a song, Build My Life. And I want you to stand here, because I'm gonna stand, I'm gonna be the first one to stand here and say, God, correct me. God, help me to be not so careless with my words. God, help me to receive the counsel. God, help me to not be driven by my emotions. I'm gonna be the first one to repent and sing to God, I will build my life on your love. I will build my life. It has to be on you, not on me. I want to build my life on your truth. And so as the song begins to play, I just want to encourage people to get off your seat. Get up out of your seat. Come down and stand here and worship God in response to what you've heard today. Would you bow your heads with me and pray? Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we praise you because you're revelatory. We praise you because you're all-knowing. We praise you because you're eternal. But Lord, though it may hurt, though it seems like it's never gonna end, we also praise you for being a father who loves us enough to correct us. We worship you, God. Earthly fathers grow weary in correcting. Earthly fathers don't correct because they don't want their kids to feel a certain way about them. But God, you are steadfast, and every time we need correction, you bring it, and we praise you, Lord, that you're not like our earthly fathers who could fall short in this. You are perfect in all of your ways. Lord, I pray that you would humble the hearts of this church family today. Humble us, Lord. Help us to come forward, not because everything everyone's doing it. Help us not to come forward out of guilt or compulsion, but help us to come forward out of a humility that says, I want to subject myself to the correction of God in whatever form it may come, because he is worthy. We love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.